Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. And welcome once again, everybody, to the Propreneur Podcast. Excited to have you here for another episode where we're going to explore how to make you more proactive, productive, and profitable in all areas of your life and business. And just like all of our episodes, our goal here is to help you really get the best practices possible for your practice. And today we actually get to have a conversation with somebody that I've known for quite a while and been able to see what they've done in their business and been able to see how they've helped out both the dental and orthodontic industry. And I'm super excited to share this information with you. So sit back, get ready, take some notes and enjoy our conversation here. Our guest today is Chip Fitchner from LPS and I'm excited to have you here. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dino. I appreciate it. Good to talk to you. Uh, that's awesome. Well, uh, one of the things we love to do here, Chip, is we love to first start off every conversation with people's stories. I think that people's stories are what connects all of us. So we'd love to hear about how you got involved in this industry and your background and history and then what brought you to this today. Fantastic, Dino. Thanks. Um, you know, my, my background really has been very entrepreneurial. And I have been buying, selling, or starting companies and taking them public and taking them private for the last 40 years. Wow. Um, I stumbled into the dental industry by buying uh, a little company out in your neighborhood about 10 years ago. And that uh, we built that company and sold it and got an education in dental. And about five years ago, we started Large Practice Sales, which focuses on helping doctors of all specialties monetize uh, a part of their life's work. Uh, so we specialize in transactions uh, for doctors who are interested in partnering with what we call an invisible dental support organization, meaning a silent partner functionally. So you help doctors kind of basically monetize now instead of just waiting for that. What I think a lot of people used to think about was that golden parachute 20 years, 30 years into their, in their practice is that and their business. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, what, what's changed is doctors uh, of increasingly younger ages are realizing the benefits of having an invisible DSO partner and the potential upside uh, in the value of their retained ownership in that partnership can be significantly higher uh, than building your practice uh, by yourself. Uh, and they really do come in as silent partners. And to give you an idea of how young the doctors are becoming doing these transactions, in January, we closed $51 million of transactions for doctors under the age of 40. Wow. And last week, we closed over, over $30 million of transactions for doctors under the age of 42. Wow, that's amazing. That gives people such a bright future about that. Let me back up here for just a moment, because I think one of the things that you tapped into, it sounds like, is one of the biggest challenges and pain points of a lot of doctors is as an entrepreneur, which you have been for years, have you, I don't know. So one of the challenges with me as an entrepreneur is that I see how so many of these doctors weren't taught to be entrepreneurs and really focus on business. They were taught how to focus on treatment and how to do the thing that they do. As you come in there and have a conversation with these doctors, are you noticing that that's one of the pain points that you get to relieve for them as part of what you do? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's interesting. Each of the invisible DSOs are a little bit different in how they operate. And some will take over more of the administrative headaches than others. And keep in mind, there's over 200 different invisible DSOs out there actively wow. seeking to partner with doctors. We have clients from Fairbanks, Alaska to Bangor, Maine, and everywhere in between. It is, wow. it is a very broad and growing category. And a lot of people think this is new when in reality, invisible DSOs have been quietly operating for over 30 years. So this has been going on for quite a while, but it does seem like it's been a little more. I mean, you've been in the press a lot more lately, too. There's a lot of I think there's a lot of more maybe conversation, maybe groundswell around it. Is that what's happening? Yeah, it really has changed. Um, so certainly invisible DSOs have been around for at least three decades. Um, and their model is to come in and buy anywhere from 51 to 90% of a practice for cash up front with the doctor retaining ownership in the balance and continuing to lead the practice under the doctor's brand, team, and strategy. The invisible DSOs, by definition, are not trying to create a national brand 
and they're not trying to homogenize the practices that they partner with. They're interested in finding great doctors that they think can benefit from the resources they can bring to that partnership, thus increasing the value of the practice for both of the partners, the invisible DSO and the doctor. Uh, but yeah, it, it has definitely accelerated. And, and part of that is because of the amount of new money that's coming into the game. Just in August of 21, for instance, Blackstone, which is the world's largest money manager with $680 billion in their private equity fund, acquired a group in Dallas called Deca Dental. Uh, and that was done at a record value. And it sort of rang the bell for many of the other of the 3,000 private, private equity firms across the globe that are now eager to get into the dental consolidation game. And keep in mind, Blackstone wasn't the first of the top 10 of the PE firms. Uh, Heartland has been owned by Colbert, Kravis, and Roberts, or KKR, since March of 2018. So it, it's becoming a very exciting category because it's been a very profitable category, not just for the investors, but for the doctors who have partnered with them. So why do you think that is? Why is it something that more of these DSOs, these these invisible DSOs, if you will, and the money has kind of awakened to this opportunity here, especially since it's been around for so long? Why why now are they stepping into this, do you think? Um, I think it's because of the size of the capital that's now chasing dental consolidation. You know, dental consolidation, depending on whose numbers you listen to, is still less than 20% of the dentists in the U.S. work for a DSO or an invisible DSO or partner mm. with. Uh, so we're still early in the game because you can compare that to medical doctors, of which 77% of all MDs as of 2021 are affiliated with either a large group or a hospital group. Now uh -huh. that consolidation has been going on for 30 years. Um, so dental consolidation is really just in its infancy. Um, but once doctors understand the benefits that a partner can bring to them, they get pretty excited about it, especially as the world has become more complex. Thank you, COVID. So what is, do you feel like is the, is there a concern that some of the doctors and the, especially in the dental and ortho profession have going the way of like the medical where they're working for these DSOs, they don't have a lot of say in what they do now, especially these big hospitals type thing. Um, it, are you, do you feel like there's a concern of that? And if, if there is, so what are the guardrails that companies like yours kind of put up to make sure that doesn't happen? No, it's really not. I mean, the invisible DSOs have no interest in telling the doctor what to do. Their goal really is to become an investor in the doctor's group and provide benefits to the doctor that may help him live a little bit better life with fewer headaches. So for instance, all of the invisible DSOs will take over banking, payroll, benefits, benefits administration, compliance, credentialing. Um, and that's about it. And they will consistently all do that. And I really don't talk to a lot of doctors that say, hey, wait, no, I don't want to give that up. I really love all of that. <laughs> I love my HR. Um, I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah, I just love the. The other thing that's been interesting is these groups are much more successful at recruiting and given the current employment uh, problems uh, uh, that we have nationally across all industries, having a strong recruiting partner has become an attractive piece of the puzzle with the invisible DSOs. We see that certainly in ortho, we see it in oral surgery and of, of hygienists across the country. Anybody who needs a hygienist is paying more today than they were a year ago. I, I didn't know that was part of it. That's really interesting because that's definitely a big pain point right now with the hiring process. I didn't realize that that was part of it. Yeah, the invisible DSOs, I mean, some of them, I can think of one that we've sold probably $300 million of practices to. They have 22 people in their, their internal recruiting department wow. that are recruiting everything from, from doctors to front desk people. Wow, that's amazing. That's really, really cool. So what are we, we obviously, I, I love to get into what the, what you hear as some objections or concerns as you're talking about earlier, where there's been DS, invisible DSO has been around for a while. Um, and it's not about making everybody homogenized. It's not about like, oh, now you're assimilating into this corporate structure. It really is allowing them to feel like they're so, they, well, they are still running their business. What are some of the negatives that you get some pushback on about DSOs that you think are maybe either um, theory or uh, hyperbole? Well, you know, it, it, traditionally, and it has been true, that if you 
sold your practice to a branded dental support organization, typically you would get most of your money up front. You would agree to work for one, two, or three years. They would hold back that money to maintain or to make sure you continued to practice and produce some level of production for the one, two, or three years after them buying your practice. And frankly, it was a transition strategy. It was doctors looking for an exit. Mm. And there was nothing wrong with that, but it's a completely different model with an invisible DSO. The younger the doctor, the happier the invisible DSO is, and frankly, the more valuable the doctor is, because Makes they're sense. looking for partners who can who can help them build. They don't want doctors who see this as a short-term transition strategy. This is truly a long-term wealth-building partnership. And so once, you know, one of the biggest trepidations of doctors is they're going to tell me what to do. They're going to tell me what insurances to take, who to hire, who to fire, what to pay them, when to take vacations. And that's just not the case. They have no interest in doing that, and they have no capability of doing that. The reason they're going to partner with your practice is you're going to remain as an owner. You're not going to become a salaried employee working for the man. You're going to be a partner. And they have found over the last 30 years that practices in which the doctor retains ownership and continues to lead the practice for years or decades produces far more profitable, faster growing, more happy patient practices than practices run by employee doctors. It's just a whole different model and it's based on ownership. So as part of that, if you have associates now or need to recruit associates in the future, they're going to create a path to ownership for your current and or future associates because it's the whole genesis of their business model. Owner doctors run better practices than employee doctors. Well, and I guess it really kind of makes sense too, right? Like you never want to buy, if I was an, an idea, so I never don't want to buy into a company that now I got to go and find a new doctor. I've got to recruit that. I've got to pay those fees to have that. I'd rather have the person that's there who knows the practice, who knows the team members, who knows the, the area and keep doing what they're doing at the best possible way they can. I'm just going to take care of some of that minutia, if you will, of running a business. Yeah. And, and you know, so the, we, we discussed the basic minutia that they're going to take over, but they provide other services that I'll call on an a la carte basis. Okay. If you need it and or want it, they're going to help you do a lot of things that can be really helpful. I'll give you a great example in ortho. Um, one of the, there are now, since ortho is usually a hot topic, there are now 13 ortho only invisible DSOs. Oh, that is up from one, one five years ago. That gives really? you an idea of how fast this category is growing. Yeah. Wow. And so the, the, there's one of those 13 invisible DSOs that focus on ortho only. And we've uh, partnered multiple clients with them. And the average client has seen a 30% growth in their top line in the first year after partnering with them for the sole reason that this group uh, has an exceptional marketing department internally that they utilize for all of their partner practices to help those practices grow. And I know that marketing is always one of the challenging things for orthos because the ortho model has changed from a lot of referrals to a lot of direct to consumer marketing right. and the ortho only invisible dso's have spent a lot of time and money understanding marketing and they obviously share that with their partner practices because it's good for both of you you know the 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 standard mantra of oh the dso is going to get me lower fees on whether it's invisalign or basic supplies yes that's true but that doesn't move the needle uh, what moves the needle is if you can partner with somebody who's marketing to drive your revenues up 30% in the first year after partnership, that's a lot more meaningful than taking your Invisalign case down a hundred or 200 bucks. Yeah, absolutely. And does, I know it depends probably on the model and on the DSO and on the deal, but in general, does the doctor participate in that growth of the practice too? Is that the way you incentivize them to want to grow the practice as well? Yeah, it, again, because they stay as owners, um, the doctors will retain ownership in one of three ways. One, they can retain ownership directly at the practice level. And with that, they will get a percentage of the practice's profits paid to them every month or every quarter based on the profitability of the practice itself. Or they may decide to become an owner within the parent company that is now their new partner. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're spreading their risk across dozens or hundreds of other practices. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and they have, they have upside in that equity. 
And so what's interesting is that the upside in that equity is can be a big number. As just an example, we sold uh, the largest orthos in two of the mountain states in October of 19. Those doctors did a transaction that were valued at about $17 million. They took $12 million in cash uh, and kept $5 million in equity in their acquirer or their parent. And that parent is about to recapitalize, which is a fancy way for saying they're selling to the next level of investor up. So same management, same people, just a new investor. The first investor is harvesting their gain. And so my doctors on that $5 million in equity in less than three years, their equity will be worth somewhere between 35 and $40 million. Wow. Which is not a bad trade for less than 36 months. Now, that's a unicorn. That doesn't right. happen. Right. But the, the, the stand, standard mantra of these groups is that their goal is to make three to five times on the investor's money in the next three to five years. And if you're a doctor who's an investor in the parent company, by virtue of partnering with them, that's a, not an unrealistic opportunity. And just in the last 60 days of 2021, there are over $4.2 billion worth of invisible DSOs that recapitalized. And so that $4.2 billion was carved up amongst the investors and the doctors. And fortunately, each of those, and there were only three of them that made up that $4.2 billion. Fortunately, we have wow. sold our clients or partnered our clients with all three of them. So they were very happy guys. Yeah, I bet so. And gas. Is there, so what's the, there, what's the risk side? What's the concern side of, of the whole process? Is it... You know, obviously, these companies like Blackstone have money like water, but what are the risks that are involved? They do. You know, the, the key risk really is understanding who's the right partner for you. you. You give me a great orthodontist today with $2 million in collections, and they're going to have six, eight, maybe even 10 different bidders. And so they're going to have the opportunity to choose from various groups because remember, each of them is different in their size, yeah. in their risk, and their reward. I mean, there was a new ortho group formed two weeks ago, and we have other ortho groups that have 350 practices across the country, and everybody else is in the middle. And then on top of that, the orthos have the potential to go into a dental trifecta where there are groups out there buying only pedo, ortho, and oral surgery practices. And in fact, in your hometown right there in the last 24 months, we've sold 48 offices to a trifecta group. They're wow. all pedos, orthos, or oral surgeons. So orthos have a lot of opportunities. So the biggest risk is not looking at all of your options because yeah. today a great ortho is going to have six, eight, ten options. Wow. And that's obviously, I always say to everybody, it's always good to have options. Tell my kids this all the time. You just want options. That's what you want. That's the key. Because then you can make an informed yeah, decision. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and, and you know, multiple bidders drives up values, and values are at record highs at the moment because of all the new capital and the new groups that are eager to get into it. Uh, but, but more importantly, it's not about squeezing the top dollar. It's about figuring out who you can live with for the next five or 10 or 20 years because this is not a one-night stand. This is a marriage, and the cultural fit is critical to the success of these transactions. And And frankly, knock on wood, I would say that 99% of our doctors are very happy in the partners that they chose, but that's only because they talked to a lot of them before they picked one. So help me out, Chip. Then you guys are basically the, the matchmakers. You guys are the ones that take an office and put them together with the right one based upon those fits. Yes, we do. And, you know, our, our goal is to understand what the doctor's goals are so that we can introduce him to the right groups that fit his vision how he wants to practice, where he wants to go. Some of that's regionally based and that some of these invisible DSOs are focusing on certain regions. But we're the advisor to the doctor. We're only paid by doctors. So our sole goal is to find doctors the right partner at the highest value. And we get paid nothing unless a transaction is completed. So we're very interested in making sure doctors find the right groups at the highest values and complete a transaction. Because if we don't, we get paid nothing. Wow, that's a very interesting place to put it. You're like the arbitrage of the DSO game right now. And like you said, there's a lot of people jumping into it. Um, why do you think there's been this kind of focus? Before it used to be a lot more GP focused. Why do you think there's more focus on, is it just the money? Is it 
seeing an opportunity and, and some of the more specialties. We have ortho, but you also talked about some other ones there. Is there a reason why you see that happening? Yeah, a part of it is because if you want to build a big organization, you look at the size of the groups. And so we use the ADA statistics just for fun. In okay. 2019, which are the most recent numbers available, uh, the average GP in the U.S. did about $747,000 in collections, and the average specialist did about $1.1 million. And these groups don't have limits on capital. So in their mind, it's easier to consolidate bigger practices than smaller practices. Mm -hmm. So literally in the last four years, you, there were no endo only consolidators. Today, there are 10. In the last six months, there were no perio consolidators. Today, there are four. In the last five years, there was one ortho consolidator. Today, 13. And in oral surgery, it was four years ago, there were zero. Today, there are 15. So the number of groups that have focused on specialty uh, has grown exponentially because, frankly, it's easier to build a bigger organization because you're buying bigger practices. Wow, that is that's fascinating how quickly it has all sprung up. And obviously, your job is to keep up on all of that to know who's doing what and who, again, is the right fit for whom. Um, who is not a fit to start looking at this as an option? Oops. Um, you know, generally speaking, the thing that buys you a ticket into uh, an invisible DSO transaction at a high value um, is having an operating profit of at least $400,000 or more after doctor compensation. And so it's tough to say you have to have collections of X or Y because practices operate at very different profit levels. Um, so what we tell doctors to do is give us a call. Let's learn about your practice. We'll take a look at your numbers and we'll give you an idea of the value of your practice in today's market. And we do that for free confidentially and without obligation. Um, and you know, I, I know there's a lot of orthos listening and vir virtually 80% of the orthos that we talk to qualify for one of these transactions, but it's, it's a function of size, frankly. So how does the process work? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor, I'm, I've heard this, I'm sitting in my car right now and I'm driving home thinking, yeah, you know, those seem very appealing. I don't know if I'm a right fit for it. Uh, you mentioned about the, the, the amounts that we would like to be looking at or what your goals are, but how does the process work? You know, the process is really simple. It's just anybody who contacts us is gonna get an appointment to talk with me. Uh, we typically have a 20 minute introductory call where I learn a little bit about the doctor's practice. And from that call, I can generally uh, discern whether the doctor is going to be a fit or not. Uh, once we have that call, if the doctor is interested in going forward, then we're going to sign a mutual non disclosure agreement, which basically says we're not going to talk about each other. We take a look, through, look at three years of PLs, no tax returns. And then one of my analysts will contact the doctor or whoever his designated bean counter is to ask some questions. And then I'll have a call with the doctor and I'll be able to tell the doctor pretty much give or take 5% what their practice is going to be worth in today's market. And so our analysis is not based on 37 pages of math. It's based on recent market transactions of similar practices in the last 60, 90 or 120 days. We did $200 million in transactions for orthos alone last year and 300 million for everybody else. And this quarter we'll do over 300 million in transactions with over a hundred of that for orthos. So we have wow. a pretty good idea of what the values are. And so once the doctor has a value, then he has a data point to know whether he's even interested in learning more or not. Um, and our process is pretty simple. If a doctor is interested in finding out and meeting prospective partners, um, they sign an agreement with us that says, hey, if you can find me a partner that I love, I'll pay you. But if you can't, I'll pay you nothing, which is fine. Um, <laughs> and uh, generally speaking, any orthodontist today that qualifies to become our client is going to have a minimum of six bidders. Um, wow. And G GPs are going to have similar amounts and all of the other specialists are well uh, are as well. It it's a very good time to be a dentist. It's a really interesting idea that I'm going to go back to your guys position of being kind of a matchmaker working the arbitrage because as you have said it boy it's a better position to be in to where you have bidders going after you as opposed to you having to do all the work to try to figure out which one's the right fit for you. 
you guys being on the side of the doctor and obviously part of, of, your, of the, of the well, you get paid by the doctor, so probably primarily for the doctor, right? Just for the doctor. It, it, and that's an important piece of this. Yeah. Um, because other, advi other advisors in this business are getting paid both by the buyer and the seller. We don't. We're only paid by the doctor, uh, which means two things. One, our, we don't have a conflict of interest. But two, we're able to show our clients to every prospective bidder, not just the bidders that will pay us a fee. So it gives the doctor the opportunity to touch all of the qualified prospects for their practice, which we think is really important. Again, That's, because it's a fit. It's not, it's not just about the money. Yeah, that is a really great uh, a prospect there because you are now, now they know they, they're not going out alone. They're not having to, uh, listen, I've had clients where I've literally had conversations with them about them choosing between this DSO and that DSO and having this type of conversation of like, well, what's a fit for you, you know, emotionally, culturally, do they share the same values, that type of thing. But having you be someone there who can do that for them and on multiple occasions. And also you have the history with, sounds like all of the other IDSOs to be able to say, this is why I think it would be based upon our past versus just guessing and uh, what they're telling like the, the stuff they're telling you now versus what we know about them because everybody's going to put their first yeah, best foot forward sure and so it, it, that's an important part of, of our process once you've uh we, we will typically have dinner between the four final bidders and the doctor on four consecutive nights so i'll fly out there we'll do an after hours practice tour have dinner, tell stories. And at the end of the week, the doctors generally got a pretty good idea of who they like and who they don't like. And so before we even start the negotiations on value, we're going to have the doctor, our client, get on the phone with other doctors who've done transactions with the group or groups that he is he or she is considering. And here at Doc to Doc, exactly what changed? Did they do what they said they were going to do? Are you glad you did it? You know, our goal is really to make sure our doctors go into these transactions with their eyes wide open because it's a long term marriage. Yeah. Um, and we spend a lot of time on making sure that our doctors understand exactly what they're going to get with their prospective partner because they're all different. We did transactions with 24 different invisible DSOs in the last 12 months. So you mentioned a couple of times uh, when they find out what the value is. Nowadays, what can people think about or figure the value or how to look at the value of their practice? If they were just thinking, well, what if I just started this conversation with you? Although obviously numbers depend, but in general, what are some of the values that doctors can expect? You know, in ortho, uh, we've done transactions for doctors. You know, doctors historically used to think of value in terms of a percentage or a fraction of collections. Um, today, uh, in the last 90 days, we've done transactions for orthodontists at over four and a half times collections or 450% of collections. Wow. The real values are, are dictated based on the profitability of the practice. And so the collections number, frankly, is irrelevant. We just translate those transactions into collections because that's what a lot of orthos are used to listening to. Um, but the transactions are usually valued as a multiple of EBITDA or operating profit. And that's after taking into consideration, compensating the doctor for what they do. But we've done transactions in the last 18 months that ranged in value from seven times EBITDA. And actually that's not true. We've done a couple at six and a half times EBITDA up to a high of 24 times EBITDA. Wow. Um, Wow. So the, the range can be really wide and it depends on how the doctor is a strategic fit uh, into the group that's considering them. Um, but if you, if you can find the right strategic fit, that high multiple of 24 X was actually done by, for a very large pedo practice that we partnered with a group that had bought 10 orthodontic practices from us in the same neighborhood. And they wanted and needed that pedo practice because they knew it would explode their orthodontic practices. So they were willing to pay an extraordinary price for it because of the long-term benefits of having 23 pedo offices in the family. Wow, that's fascinating. Okay, I'm always interested in um, the ones that didn't work out. And being that you're the matchmaker, obviously, and not all things, you know, you get to the wedding date and it's like the bride backs out, right? I'm sure you got to yep. have a great story, 
of some situation where you thought it was all going to go well and then you just found out yeah it's just not going to and last minute pulls back can you tell us one of those sure absolutely and, and and the worst one that i can tell you sadly is an oral surgery transaction it was a multi-doctor practice two owner doctors and it turns out that both of them were having a relationship with the same assistant within the same practice oh, and they snap. didn't know about it until three days before closing so obviously they did not want to be partners anymore and therefore our transaction did not complete uh, but, but but there are others that are similar to that um so you know the the, the real question is post closing how many doctors are happy and the doctors who aren't happy why aren't they happy yeah great um, question. and the only one you know the only one i can think of is an ortho practice that uh, we partnered with a group we counseled the doctor that the group was too young and too new and we did not have any experience with them we didn't know whether they could integrate or not uh, but the the founders of that uh, ortho invisible dso uh, were great salespeople, uh, had known uh, our clients socially elsewhere and convinced him to join them we we suggested that he not but he did and, and i actually talked to him last week and he said, this is the I told you so call, isn't it? And I'm like, oh. no, this is not an I told you so call, but how's it going? He said, you were right. I was the guinea pig for their integration and operations, and it has been painful, but it's going to be okay. So again, it's it's about who you choose as a partner. And, and we've done transactions. We did a great transaction for Ortho in North Carolina. He became the founding DSO for a brand new startup uh, platform. Um, and it took us, because North Carolina is its own unique animal, it took us about 12 months to get that transaction completed. And he knew there were going to be hiccups and bumps because he was the founding practice for the investors. Uh, but he's happy as he can be because he said, I got to be the part of building something, something and that group's now up to 50 or 60 practices. Wow. And he's very excited. And yes, he, he did experience the slings and arrows of functionally a startup, uh, but he's really happy about it. Wow, that's amazing. Jeez, yeah, you never even think about all the little side information that you don't realize like that when two people are having a relationship with the same person and how that can blow up your business transaction. Like, yeah, geez. especially it, especially mine. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like that must not have been a very good evening for you all there at FPS. No, it, it really wasn't. It was a great practice, but uh, yeah. Wow. things happen wow then there's the the all the checks that are being written after that with the, <laughs> that dissolves the partnerships and probably some spouses involved and that's not a good day yeah there there were as a matter of fact yeah no it was it was a community property thing that's why that's why i do what i do so <laughs> <laughs> wow understood well Chip, thank you so much for explaining. First of all, um, I personally wasn't uh, wasn't totally aware of the IDSO aspect aspect of it, the way that you guys implement what you do, um, and how you are really that middleman, that advocate for the doctors. I tell doctors all the time inside their practices, they can they got to figure out who their advocates are, and here is a great way to have an advocate if you're thinking about taking on a DSO and, and, and selling your practice to one of them and partnering with them, I would say. And that's, that's pretty awesome. Thank you for sharing all the information. Is there anything else that we've left out that we want to make sure that people know about what you do and about how you can help them? Yeah, I, I think that the most important emphasis is to understand that this is not selling out. This is a partnership. Mm. And they don't want to micromanage your business. They don't want to run your business. They want to help you take the headaches away from what you may do day to day, but they have no desire to tell you what to do or how to run your practice. And it's a very important distinction from the old model and some of the horror stories you heard about DSOs that acquired practices. Mm -hmm. And those groups historically were, were interested in homogenizing their operations. They would go in and say, Hey doctor, here's your playbook. This is what you're going to do. And that's not the way, the way the invisible DSOs operate. Um, you know, there's one invisible DSO, it's a great story, uh, that has three different practices, uh, all GPs, in the same office building in Baltimore. And they're all branded differently. One of them is heavy Medicaid, one of them's all fee for service, and the other one's right in the middle. But they all have the same invisible DSO partner, but nobody knows it. And wow. their goal is not to homogenize or merge those practices. 
it's just a way for the DSO to take advantage of the different types of patients out there. And wow. so in ortho, you'll see practices that are, you know, in the same group that are $7,000 and up case fees. And, you know, the other practices within the same group will be $4,000 case fees. So again, they're not trying to homogenize or make all the practices the same. They're interested in investing in great doctors. Um, mm-hmm. And fortunately, a lot of them are, are going away from geographic focus to as, as one founder of a DSO that now has 450 offices. And we sold them office number 37 about three years ago. Wow. Uh, said to me, he said, look, I don't, I don't care where they are. I am just interested in having great doctor partners. I am regionally agnostic. You know, that's uh, for me, I deal a lot with the teams, right? And dealing with uh, that unification of teams. And I love hearing that because I know it's a worry and a concern for so many teams that get word of or hear or concern that their doctors might partner up with the DSO, that how it's going to change their life. And now somebody's going to come in and change the culture and change it. And I've, I've said for our years, it doesn't have to be that way. And I actually believe, and I think you and I were having a conversation about this before, about how when someone has a strong culture, a strong team, uh, strong, uh, uh, known in their, na- in their neighborhood or their environment there, that that's a huge benefit for these DSOs. And they love that because they don't have to turn Absolutely. it around. Yeah, no, they, they are not interested in turnaround projects. That, that is... We have never sold a turnaround project. They're interested in well-managed groups with a great doctor and great teams. And you know, that's an interesting side benefit that we don't get to talk about very often is that the teams are usually exceptionally happy because the teams that end up in every case without exception with equal to or better benefit, typically at a lower cost for everybody, only because of the size of the invisible DSO enables them to buy benefits cheaper than an individual doctor can. Mm. Um, you know, teams have, have trepidation about this. What's going to change? Am I going to lose my job or my benefits going to go away? And the answer is no. Um, the, 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 all these groups are buying. It's a great doctor with a great team. Other than that, you may have beautiful lobby art and wonderful furniture, but frankly, that's not worth 5% of what they're going to pay you for your practice. They're buying you and your team and your leadership ability. Yeah, so true. I I think that the value of that is so uh, oftentimes underrated and not really thought about, but that's where the focus is. You, uh, and it makes sense, right? If you're going to buy a business, you want to buy a business that's well-oiled machine. People want to be there. The culture is awesome. Uh, Absolutely. That just makes so much more sense. Wow. Okay. So we have talked about a ton of stuff. Hopefully everybody listening, you've written a lot of notes and you know, at the end of my show, every single guest gets the same six questions. They're rapid fire, just whatever is top of your head. Uh, we've come to that point in our show. Are you ready to play? Yes, sir. I'm ready to play. Awesome. You've seen a lot of practices and you see what's going on. It doesn't matter what industry, whether it's ortho or, or GP or I don't know. Do you guys do a uh, plastic surgeon? We do not. We only are in dental. Only in dental. Okay. So in the dental space, what do you believe? Question number one is what do you believe is the most expensive thing that private practice owners are missing in their practices? Most expensive things that they don't have. Yeah. That they don't have that they're skipping over. They're deciding not to do. Uh, Not in all cases, but in many cases, a great website. A great website is worth every dime you spend on it. That is so true. I never, I haven't ever had that answer before. And I go up to websites before I go out to practice to see, okay, was this done 10 years ago by a high school student or is this professional done? You're right. That's true. That's a good point. But your foot, yep. best foot forward. Um, what is a book that you believe every practice owner should read? You know, my, my book, and I've given away hundreds of copies of the book, and it's got a deceptive title called How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success Through Selling. And it was written by a guy named Frank Betcher in, I believe, 1947. Wow. And his book is really not about selling. It's about persistence and persistence in how life is a numbers game. And as long as you understand that life is a numbers game, you know, if you don't succeed at first, try again. 
but it's a great book. It's a short read, and I have given away hundreds of copies. And if anybody wants a copy, have a conversation with me, and I'll, I'll send you one with love my it. own personal inscription. It's a great that's, book. That's awesome. I love giving away books. It's so, so great. Ah, I love that you do that. Okay. Well, speaking of books, in my first book, The Practice Rx, I, I focus a lot on team, team culture and team performance as the foundation for business growth. Again, you see so many practices. You, ha you have a very unique opportunity and vision to see all these different practices. What do you see as the biggest challenge that private practice owners are facing with their teams and office culture? They're facing that challenge, teams and office culture. <laughs> the ability right now, to re retain, retain and motivate your teams is critical because consistency of smiling, happy people who think of the little things. Uh, I was on the phone today with a phenomenal ortho practice uh, that was a startup. And in its first uh, 15 months, it did over $5 million in production. Wow. And this was a practice in, in a strip center in a not so great neighborhood in 2,400 square feet. And the thing that made them successful was their smiling, happy people. You didn't get to walk in the front door of that office because somebody was there opening the door for you before you got to reach for the handle and greeting you. Wow. Um, and the, the same, this, the same group, uh, the way they made friends with the dental community is the doctor had a party every year and invited every dental professional, not the doctors, but all the girls, as I call them, uh, from the 50 offices near them and, and through a very expensive party. But that was really, other than his digital marketing, was the only marketing he did. And it, it was all about the culture of his practice, which was fun, respectful, and you didn't get in that front door without somebody opening it for you. It's about the people. You it, can be a great orthodontist, but, but if you can't manage the people, you're not going to win. A hundred percent. I've often say you can fake a lot of things in business, but you cannot fake leadership and culture. So it's so good. Yep. It's funny too, that, that, that party, the cheapest thing he probably ever does, even though it's, you know, it's expensive for him to do it. It's the cheapest because that's great marketing. There's no better marketing than word of mouth. I agree. That's awesome. I agree. All right. Number four, very important question, obviously, how can people reach out to you and, and get a hold of you if they want to have a conversation? Visit largepracticesales.com and there's a way to contact us by phone, by email, or by Pony Express. <laughs> That's great. Well, I highly encourage everybody, look, just start the conversation or just find out more. You can obviously tell Chip loves to, to give information. He doesn't hold anything back. I think it's really important for you to do that if you're even thinking at all that this might be a fit for you. Question number five, what's the best advice? And this is a hard one, but off the top of your head, what's the best advice you've ever received in life or in business? Best advice I've ever received in life or business was probably the decision to marry my lovely wife that we've been together for 40 years and married for 32 fabulous years because she has put up with me through thick and thin. So that's probably the best advice I've ever gotten. I love it. That's the best answer. And it's the only time it's been said on this show. And it's so true. Get somebody behind you who can put up with your crap, but will stick by you. Oh, that's well, so I didn't cool. say crap. Well, I didn't mean crap. <laughs> I, I talked to her beforehand. Uh, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> that's awesome. 42 years, 46 years, would you say? We've, we've been together for 42 fabulous years. 42 fabulous years. That's amazing. That's awesome. Okay, last question. What do you think is the best resource or tool that a private practice owner can use to grow their practice? Talking to other doctors. Um, I, I think doctors are inherently eager to share uh, their successes and their failures. And for some reason, every doctor thinks that every other doctor is a direct competitor with them, and they're not and you know study groups and trade shows it's a great place to learn new things uh, so i think communicating with other doctors everybody learns something i know i do i learn something new every single day from the doctors that i talk to that's such good advice and i it's interesting it, it's very timely it's come up in a conversation recently with a doctor that i was talking to about uh, a, a, somebody in his area and he was talking about the four or five different people in the area. And I, I said, how many of those guys do you feel go to events and go to study clubs and go to seminars and stuff? And he's like, oh, none of them. Like I, he was one of the boards of the local chapter of whatever association. He's like, I've never seen them. 
And I think the statistics are something like only 20% of doctors ever get some sort of consultant, about 10% actually ever go, and I don't know how dramatic that is, go to events and get education that way. But talking to other doctors and knowing that we're all doing this, right? We're all struggling in some way and there's no competition. It's just cooperation or not. So I love it. Yeah. And, and they're usually happy to share if you ask the question. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Wow. That was a, a ton of time. I told you it would only be about 40 minutes. It definitely went longer because you had some great information. I really appreciate you being open and sharing so much with everybody. It, it really means a lot. Exciting times to be a dentist. Great time to be in this business. Yeah. A lot absolutely. of value to be created for doctors who see the opportunity. Absolutely. I totally agree. Well, thank you again, Chip. I really, really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, please reach out to Chip. Go to largepracticesales.com and have a conversation. That's all it is, a conversation. And who knows where it will lead. It can lead to some amazing, amazing opportunities for you. Well, that's it, everybody, for another Never episode. Never to learn. Never hurts to learn. Absolutely. That's it, everybody, for another episode of uh, the Propreneur Podcast. And again, our goal here is always to help you become more proactive, productive, and profitable in all our areas of your life. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends and colleagues. As always, we love hearing from you and your experiences and, and your uh, opportunities that you have and love to have you on the podcast as well if you feel like you'd be a fit. We'll see you on the next episode, everybody. Thanks so much again for listening to the Propreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.